All right, folks, what's going on? We are back again. I am your host, Drew, at Houdini16 on Twitter. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Josh, at Stonewall MMA. We're here to break down UFC Fight Night 111 from Singapore with the worst main event of all time. Holly Holm versus Betch Kohea. Stillman, what's good? How are you? How was your last weekend? Are you looking forward to waking up at 4.30 to watch this? Uh, I am looking forward to waking up at four thirty to watch this. I don't really mind that much because school will be out, so whatever I can do whatever I want. Uh, I guess that means I can. I mean, I guess that means I, I want to wake up at four thirty in the morning, like some sort of moron. I would never wake up anywhere close that early for school. Um, but yeah, I don't mind. It's summer. I got two more days left of school. I'm pretty much done with the kids. I just got to like sign out and like clean my room up and stuff. So I'm living the good life over here. Um, Although it is thunderstorming out, so hopefully I don't cut out or anything crazy like that. And I'm moving next week, so doing the pod next week might be a little bit tricky. Yeah, um, I'm going to be on vacation all next week, so uh, we'll talk about next week. All right. Um, anyway, guys, we've got Holly Holm looking to get back on track after three straight losses. Uh, she's going to meet the former title, title challenger, Betch, Betch Kohea, in the Fight Pass main event. Uh, elsewhere, Rafael Dos Anjos, RDA, makes his welterweight debut against Tarek Safadine. Uh, there's some other potential cool... Action packed fights in this, uh, a couple heavyweight slobber knockers. Uh, so we'll get, get down and break into that. Uh, but before we do that, um, Connor and Floyd, it's booked as of like an hour ago. Um, really looking forward to this one. They've already started the jabs. Connor posted a picture on Twitter of him next to Floyd. May- it was photoshopped. It was Floyd right next to Floyd Mayweather Sr. And I forget what he said. Like, Looking forward to the fight or something. like I don't know. It's hilarious, but I can't wait. It's going to be so sick. Josh is going to bet his life savings on Connor. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm kind of expecting you to. I'm kind of, I'm kind of expecting you to like mark out and just you know get all into the promotion. And Mayweather's, Mayweather's going to out-trash talk. I'm sorry. McGregor's going to out-trash talk Mayweather because Mayweather can't string two sentences together. That's a fact. So um, you're just going to be like, oh, man, Connor's going to do it. Uh, and, all your money on him like an idiot uh i'm just depressed that this this is happening um because we could be watching like some actual good fights but instead we get this clown ass circus with these are you gonna pay for it no i'm not 100 percent. you're like the only one in america 100 percent. i'm coming down to your new place that weekend we're buying it no we're not buying it yeah we are i'll buy it for you fine sit in the other room as i watch do i buy it I, like I didn't used to buy a lot of the pay per views, but I've been lately just because it's a lot easier to like work during them rather than having to go to like Buffalo Wild Wings where you can't hear anything. And um, and I don't mind like supporting fighters like Max Holloway and like Jose Otto and stuff, but I'm not giving Mayweather or McGregor one cent of my money. They can go die in a fire. That might be a little harsh, but I dislike both of them, so I'm not giving them any money. So yeah, I need to find someone else to like buy it for me so i i mean i I have to watch it obviously um i don't know it's just i'm kind of wondering where mma is going to be afterward where where uh, mcgregor's going to go afterward is he going to fight again after making like bajillion dollars it's just a uh sad depressing carnival to me but that's you're a carnival my my depressing take so (laughs) anyway well when i ship this MMA bracket tournament. I'll buy it for you. Perfect. Yeah. So let's get back to more uh, uh, pleasant news, uh, and that you are still alive somehow. Your yeah. joke Ooh. ass is still in this bracket qualifier. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, talk talk real quick about uh, last week. How did you how did you manage to eke that one out? All right. So everybody talks about like MMA DFS sweats and all that. You know, waiting on that last fight for you know to ship a tournament. I've never been in a worse sweat in my life. The card was over. It was over. I had like a 13-point lead. And we all know that DraftKings is slow with their scoring, so they updated it. I have an 8-point lead. And then I'm looking, 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 and all my other payouts dropped a little bit based on the uh, main event. And I panicked, so I went and looked at my matchup, and I won by 2 points. Uh, I'll break down the lineup here. Where are we at? So, there we go. Wan Shen is the guy I played. And his lineup was as follows. Kudalaba, Elliot, Lewis, Mokhtarian, Pichel, and Volkanovski. 
Um, I decided to fade Volkanovski. I went with Derek Brunson. I thought he was good for a first-round KO. It worked, worked out for me. Kudalabo is pretty much a plug-and-play. I also went with Elliot. He burned every single person in the industry. Uh, I also went with Mokhtarian. He got stormed. I went with Pichel and Dominic Steele. I was really high on Dominic Steele, and he laid a complete and total egg. So basically, it was Derek Brunson and Dominic Steele versus um, Derek Lewis and Volkanovski. So I needed to Derek Brunson to outscore Lewis by, I don't know, X amount of points. But at the end of the day, I got it done. Not my most impressive score. I, I'm moving on with a score of 362.5. Um, but it's all that matters, man. I'm in the Elite Eight. Uh, thank you to you, Josh, because I use a lot of your analysis and research. So you have a hand in this. Um, not a big hand in it. Don't get any, don't get any ideas over there. Pay me, son. <laughs> Oh, uh, I'll throw you a few shekels. <laughs> Very kind of you, sir. Yeah, man. So I don't forget about where I came from. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shoot. All right. Good man. Good man. Enough uh, of that. Yeah. Best we of luck the next this week. Um, I appreciate that. I have to wake up at 430. Unfortunately, I will be at my girlfriend's house. We're going on a week vacation with her family. So I'm hoping to sneak out. And I mean, no one's going to be up at 430. I'm just going to wake up and turn on the computer, to be honest. But. Yeah. Uh, all right. Yeah, what do you say? What do you say we break down some fights here? Yeah. Hopefully you can keep this uh, Cinderella run going. Cinderella, I'm the number one seed in that tournament. Who the hell are you talking to? Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> I think Chris went down this weekend, and he was actually the OG. So. Oh dang. Yeah. That's too bad. We're gonna bring it home for this channel. <laughs> Absolutely. That's yep. the spirit. All <laughs> right. Yeah. Let's uh, let's dive right into UFC Sing a Suck. Um. <laughs> So we got first up Lucy Pudalo. Actually, to be fair, this card isn't that bad. Uh, the main event is trash, but yeah, the main event stinks. But I'm actually looking forward to some of these other fights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, pardon me, pardon me. Um, all right. So first up, we got uh, these are bantamweights, correct? Yep. Lucy Pudalova and Ji Yan Kim, uh, UFC newcomer. Uh, they opened at minus one twenty each, uh, but Pudalova has since gone out to minus one fifty five, while Kim is now the underdog at plus one thirty five. Um, Kim is priced at 8,000 and Pudalova is priced at 8,200 on DraftKings. Pudalova has an inside distance prop of 266 plus 266 and Kim's is plus 437. So what do you think about this one? Um, any value or any upside in this fight? Yeah, I think there's some value in Kim here. Um, Fire Fist is her name. She trains with the Korean zombie in South Korea. She's the number one fighter coming out of South Korea. Um, I do like her, but I'll, I'll jump into Pudalova a little bit first. She's 22 years old. Uh, she made her debut against uh, Lena Landsberg, which was an absolute war. And uh, personally, I think it could have gone either way, uh, going to the decision. Landsberg's eye was completely busted up. Um, she prefers to strike. She's a good high-paced striker. Um, utilizes her jab really, really well. But one of the things that I noticed that, I mean, aside from being aggressive and tough, one of the things I noticed that, um, she was weak at and struggled with was the clinch up against the fence, kind of being bullied and bossed around. Um, and I think fire fist Kim is going to use that to her advantage. She, um, I'll break her down a little bit. She's a decent boxer. Her striking's okay. She likes her over the overhand, right? Um, I'm not, I think she has a couple TKO finishes. I'll have to look again, but, um, there's a story I just read that in training, she actually broke the orbital bone of the Korean zombie. So she's got to have some power in her hands. Um, she really excels on the ground and I think she's going to work her, work the clinch up against the fence, uh, and look for the trip, look for the throw. She doesn't really shoot for traditional takedowns. Um, I watched a lot of her YouTube videos and highlights and never once did she like shoot for a single leg or double leg. Um, she, you know, she likes to grapple and clinch up against the fence, look for trips, um, kind of, you know, weigh down, weigh them down or, you know, ride this and suffocating. Am I there? Yeah, you cut out for just a second, but you're, you're good now. Looks like I'm, I'm froze on my end. We're not going to see your mug um, anyway. Yeah, so once you talk it up. Sick, dude. Um, she's got good BJJ grappling, suffocating on top. Um, I'm concerned with the level of talent um, that she's faced. It is a limited sample size, um, but I do like her advantage on the ground. On the feet, I'm going to give it to Pudalava. Uh, Kim tends to eat shots. She's not very defensively sound. 
in the striking department. Um, and another interesting fact, she was actually offered the to fight Holly home on this card, and Holly actually turned the fight down. So I don't know. What... I'll be here on Kim. Um, I do not hate her. Um, I'm not too sure what her ownership's going to be because she's kind of in that mid range. She's kind of. I think we'll see a lot of stars and scrubs in this card, and she might get overlooked a little bit. And I think there's some value there. Uh, so I'm definitely going to have some exposure to her uh, in this one. Let's see. What do we say? Did I? My computer's like frozen, dude. I'm sorry. She's 8,000. And so you think that she can like get it done with grappling. You said that that's where she's really strong. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I do. And I think that's where Pudalava kind of struggled was up against the fence and on the ground. I haven't seen much of her ground game, um, but she wasn't very defensively sound when it comes to takedowns. So I think there's some value on Kim here. I'm going to target her in this fight. Uh, and I think it's going to get to the ground at some point. And I think she has the opportunity. Uh, so that basically both formats. I haven't really built my cash game lineup yet. Um, so we'll see if we go that way. But I wouldn't hate it one bit if you played her either way. Okay, cool. I don't know if you need to like plug in or what, but you're going a little bit in and out. Hopefully that fixes itself. Um, but real quick, do you want to... Um, I'll get into the next flyweight fight. You want to hit me with uh, prices and stuff real fast? Uh, I can't see them on my computer right now. All right, never mind. I got you. Um, so we got... I forget what this dude's actual first name is. I've just been calling him CJ. Uh, Carl's John de Tomas, de Toma, uh, versus uh, Nauki Inoue. Uh, these are two flyweight guys, uh, both newcomers to the UFC. Um, Drew, I guess, is bouncing out. Hopefully, he'll be able to come back in and everything will fix. Um, but I'll just get at you guys with this breakdown real fast. Uh, Inoue is 8,900 on DraftKings. He opened at minus 265, but is now out to minus 300. De Tomas opened at plus 185 and is now on to plus 250. Um, Inoue has one of the best finished props on the card. It is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the sixth best finished prop on the card at plus 109. De Tomas has uh, a finished prop of plus 652. So um, I am on board with those odds. Uh, Inoue, by the way, is 8,900 and uh, De Tomas is 7,300, if I didn't say that already. Um, Inoue... <sighs> This, it's kind of a weird fight because um, the only fights that I could find of Inoue, shout out to Brett's um, premium chat. I'm sorry, his... Um, blanking on the name, not premium chat, but his premium service, his subscription service um, on Roto Grinders has that new fight library, which is clutch. It was clutch for this because um, he already had up several fights from both of these guys when I went to go do research. So definitely check that out the premium um, marketplace on Roto Grinders. Um, and shout out to Brett and Chris again for having us on um, their channel. We appreciate it and hope you guys are enjoying the content. Back at it. Um, so, Inoue only has like three fights on um, that I could find, and they all ended in the first round, while Day to Amas had like four fights, and two of them were. Uh, 25 minute title fights. So we got a lot to got to see a lot more of Day Tomas in his game versus Inoue was like blowing these dudes out in the first round. But uh, I was really still impressed with Inoue. Um, in his most recent fight that was that I could see, he um, his opponent came at him really aggressively uh, with punches because Inoue is like a ground fighter and and really really tall. Um, so his opponent came at him with like like looping punches and Inoue showed that he's really been working on his jab and distance management and. Uh, snapped, um, I think it was Kato was his name, Kato's head back with a jab before dropping him with a one-two um, as he tried to aggressively tried to come forward and then jumped on his back for the submission. And um, he's, also, he's just shown that he's a really good grappler. He can float really well on top um, and has really nasty submissions. De Tomas, by contrast, is a power puncher and a power wrestler. Um, he's got decent top control for 125, at least against like the level of competition that he's been facing which um, I think he's been fighting in like a Filipino organization. So he's probably not fighting like the best of the best, but I mean, he looks like a solid, a solid fighter. Um, he hits like big high amplitude takedowns and um, has like pretty hard ground and pound, but he's not much of a submission threat. He's got a couple submissions on his record, but um, in his two title fights, um, he's mostly looking to ground and pound on top. Um, and when he gets put, but when he gets put on his back, he doesn't really have a lot to offer at all. Like he just closes his guard and hangs out. I saw him like trying to punch from his back for like a minute 
or something um, while one dude was like laying hammer fists, like really hard hammer fists on him. Um, so that's not a, a good strategy ever pretty much. Um, on the feet, he's a, a power puncher who um, likes to throw left high kicks from the southpaw stance. Um, pretty much the way I see the fight going is that um, in a way he's going to pump the jab, use his reach. Um, De Tomas is going to either because he's frustrated or because that's just what he usually does, he's going to shoot in and try to take Inoue down, and Inoue is going to take over the fight from there and end up with submission in the first or second round. Um, so in terms of a play here, I like Inoue in really either format. Um, De Tomas doesn't have a knockout on his record, so I'm not too concerned about his like power punching. And Inoue, like I said, his striking has looked better and better. Both these guys are only 20, so um, you could ex- you should expect they're going to be making strides. And it might be, they might look you know, much better. De Tomas might look much better than he did the last time out, but um, his last two title fights, I've, I saw a lot of the same problems. Um, the difficulty that he had from the guard, um, the inability to really like advance and finish people. He would get someone's back and just not be able to finish them. Um, and Inoue doesn't have that problem at all. So I like Inoue here. Uh, De Tomas could, I think he might not, he might be like um, an okay GBP punt, if he can survive and score a bunch of takedowns and just like, even if he gets, even if he ends up getting out grappled or loses a decision, um, he, I mean, shoot, he could, he could win if he can not get submitted and stay on top for long enough. Um, he could pay off his price tag for sure. Um, I just don't see the finish upside with him. Um, and he could also get subbed down the first round. So I'm a little bit wary of him in cash. So um, I think he's a GBP play for me for the most part. Um, you back, dude? How's it going? I'm back, dude. Sorry about that. I don't know what the heck happened. It's all good. Um, we're going to move on to Doan and Kwok. You know it. All right. So Russell Doan um, is fighting Quan Ho Kwok. These guys are bantamweights, right? Yes. Cool. Um, so Kwok opened at minus 165, but the line is closed. He's now minus 130. Doan opened at plus 125. He's now at plus 110. Kwok is 8,600 on DraftKings to Doan's 7,600. Um Quark's inside distance is plus 185, and Dones is plus 244. So who do you like in this one? Do you agree with Vegas, or are you um, going to go for the value on, on Dones? I think I'm going to lean value on here um, if I'm going to play this fight. I think um, I think Dones, there, there's some value into that, and you can save a few dollars. Uh, Quark, he's a Taekwondo practitioner, six knockouts to his name. Uh, he's really, really fast. He's a disciplined striker. Um, in his recent fight with Brett Johns, he throwed, he showed a lot of explosiveness um, at points during the fight. He kind of gassed, though, because Brett Johns kind of took it to him in the grappling game. Took him down 11 times, I believe. Um, so, yeah, that immediately right there raises some red flags for me. Uh, some of the other issues that I saw from him, uh, keeps his head high, and in grappling exchanges, he tends to gas out if it's a grappling-heavy fight. Um, and like when he exchanges and he comes in for, you know, to throw strikes, like I said, he's kind of standing up tall and he leaves himself open to be taken down. Um, I think there's potential in this kid going forward, but I don't think this is his fight. Um, I'm going to lean down on this one. Who is a, he's a really sharp, fast starter. Um, in his most recent fight, he lost in the first round via submission to um, Beck Dick, but he took the fight on five days. So I don't really, you know, put, a ton of stock into that one, but he's a really big bantamweight. Um, throws a ton of hard, heavy kicks, um, and he had a a good performance against Pedro Munoz. I think he was carrying the majority of that fight, and he was caught in a scramble and he got choked out, unfortunately. But he looked like he had the advantage to me on the feet. Um, early in his career, he really relied on his wrestling and grappling, maybe a little too much, never really opened up. Um, but as he's grown. He um, uses his striking more and more, and he's confident in it, justified by the, the Moon Nose performance. Um, but he can always rely on those takedowns and grapplings, grappling exchanges. That's where Kwok kind of struggles. So I think that's I'm going to give him the advantage there. Uh, he has a belt in jiu-jitsu. I'm not sure we were talking whether it was blue belt or black belt, but I think it was a blue belt. Um, but, yeah, what some people don't know about him is he turned down a Division One wrestling scholarship to pursue MMA, so he has that wrestling pedigree. And for that reason alone, um, well, not alone, but for that reason, I'm going to side with him in this fight. Uh, I think it's a good matchup for him. Um, and I'm not sold on Quok's ground game. So 
Uh, I'm, I'm going to be on down here. I'll probably have some exposure to both of these guys. Um, but yeah, I'm going to lean down in this fight. Okay. Uh, good stuff. Yeah. I mean, I like Don a lot. I hope they can get a win. Um, yeah, yeah, he really got fed to the lines there, having to fight Mursad Bektik after a, uh, a he already is on a three fight losing streak. Um, despite Bektik losing to Darren Elkins, he is like one of the best prospects in the sport, definitely in this division. So um, I hope he can get it done. Uh, like the grappling ability there for Doan. So I am with you. And I think there's a little bit of value just line wise. He's only plus 110 and he's priced at 7,600. So you got to like that as well. Um, ready to move on to the next one? Yes, sir. We got Lee Jung Ling versus Lee Jung Lang, however you say, versus Frank Camacho. Uh, Lee comes in at 9,400, is the minus 420 favorite with a finish prop of minus 120. Camacho is 6,800. The comeback is 335 with a plus 490 finish prop. Uh, you all in on Lee on this one? Um, his his price is a little bit high, obviously. He's, what is he? Uh, 9,400. He's the second most expensive guy on the card, uh, but he should definitely win, so I'm going to have shares of him for sure. Um, Camacho is a, well, let me clarify. I guess he should win for a couple of reasons. One, Camacho actually looks like a really similar version of Jing Lang. Um, he's not as experienced. He's not quite as good as a re- as good of a wrestler, um, but they both are like boxers with power who like to bang, who have pretty solid chins, um, solid takedown defense. Um, but just Li Jing Lang just is more experienced. Obviously, he's four and two in the UFC, so he's shown that he can fight and win at this level. Camacho, by contrast, is coming off of a a, a war that he was in like three weeks ago against a guy who was three and one at the time. Um, so his level of competition, he does have a win over, uh, Keita Nakamura, who is in the UFC, as far as I know at this point. Um, so that's good. Uh, he's 20 and four. So it's not like he's only, you know, it's not like he's inexperienced or anything. Um, so there's, there's, there are things to like about Camacho and, and, um, Lee is hittable. Um, he's got, a, he's shown to have a pretty ridiculous chin, but he got hurt in his last fight, um, by a guy who is mostly a wrestler. So that's worrisome, um, but he managed to like recover and ended up knocking um, that dude out. I'm blanking on his name right now, but um, so com- for that reason, I think Camacho could be like a sneaky, like not you know that you want to have a lot of exposure to him, but if you want to throw him in GBPs, um, him hurting and sparking out Lee wouldn't be the craziest thing in the world. But like I said, he's taking this fight on like ten days' notice. Um, only fought three weeks ago. So he should be like, you know, there's the double edged sword. He should be in shape, but he also got like beat up pretty bad in that fight. Um, Was pretty much losing. I think for the most part, Um, ate a whole bunch of head kicks, got taken down and like had to fight out of like some of some submissions before getting his own like arm triangle in a, in a scramble. So um, I like Lee, but he, is I don't know. Not that he's inconsistent, but he's just a little bit like too loose and open. Um, he kind of scares me for that reason in cash. And I don't know that he necessarily is uh, super likely to get like a first round stoppage. But his 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 finish probably is minus one twenty, and he's what minus four twenty at this point to win. So um, you know, someone like that should be safe for cash. Um, he might be a, a dude who you can pivot off of the heavyweights. Um, we were, saw people talking on Twitter. Um, people that like are in the uh, like rotor grinders slash DFS MMA um, sphere talking about potentially playing um, a heavyweight or two in cash. Um, so Lee might be a dude who you could like pivot off of that in tournaments or um, use instead of one of those heavyweights if that kind of scares you off. So that's kind of my take. Um, you have anything you want to add to this? No, I think you hit it on the head right there. Uh, I agree. I like him a lot in this fight. Uh, I don't know how much exposure I'll have to Camacho, but yeah. Um, yeah, I like it. Nice breakdown. All right, cool. So we got Flyweights next. Olka Sasaki is taking on Justin Scoggins. Um, so Scoggins opened up as a huge favorite, minus 555, and Sasaki opened at plus 365. It's tightened, well... The line on Scoggins has tightened a little bit, but he's still minus 525, and Sasaki is now a plus 415 underdog. Scoggins' inside distance prop is plus 109, while Sasaki's is plus 599. 
Scoggins is priced at 9300 on DraftKings, and Sasaki is priced at 6900 on DraftKings. That line seems a little wide to me. I thought Sasaki looked like noticeably better in his most recent fight against Hayes. He ended up losing, but he gave you know a title challenger a fight and looked a lot better. So what are you thinking on this one? Yeah, um, I'm kind of torn on this fight. I really, really like Scoggins. I think he is an outstanding wrestler, like amazing. Um, he averages what I think it's four point yeah four point two six takedowns per fight. Um, if you watch his fight with Ray Borg, he handled himself, took him down four times. Um, where am I at here? Yeah, same thing with Pedro Munoz. Had the advantage all fight over Pedro Munoz, but uh, walked right into a guillotine. And that's I think a lot of people are holding on to that. He kind of finds himself in crappy submission positions and gets choked out. And you look at Sasaki who. Um, is really long, tall, uh, uses his limbs really, really well, limits damage, and, you know, is always looking for submissions. Um, so I'm kind of torn in this fight. I, I do side with Scoggins on this one, um, but I don't know how much exposure I'll have to GPPs. Uh, I'm kind of nervous about that finish prop here because Sasaki did a really good job against Wilson Hayes. Uh, granted, yes, he was taken down six times, but... Um, He's going to have that height and reach advantage. If he establishes that jab and keeps him at range, I think Scoggins is going to have a tougher time getting in. Uh, I think he's going to have to throw a lot of feints to get in close and look for that takedown. And another issue, one of the biggest issues, biggest opponents for Scoggins this week is the um, scale. He's returning to the flyweight division. Uh, he had weight issues at flyweight in the past. Um, so that, that's always an issue there. But I'll side with Scoggins here. He's a fluid striker. Um, doesn't really telegraph much. He's super fast. And I think he could use his angles and footwork to, you know, move around the jab and find him, you know, use angles to get through those, uh, the long reach of Sasaki and get him to the ground. I just, Vegas likes this to finish. I'm not so sure if I agree with that. Um, still up in the air. I got to watch a little more film on it, a little more in depth. But I'll side with Scoggins here. Um, Based on my theory, Sasaki, this might be wild, could be okay in cash. Um, I think he's good defensively enough off his back to uh, defend off submission attempts or, you know, finish being finished. Um, so, yeah, I'm kind of on the fence in this one. I really don't mind either of these guys in GPPs. I think a lot of people are going to – I've seen a lot of people already tweeting about, like, you know, the favorite dogs to pick, and Sasaki's getting a lot of love. So I wouldn't be shocked to see his ownership up there in that kind of – uh, leads me to maybe pivot off one of the higher guys with Scoggins and look for that um, finish. I think at the high-priced heavyweight, Scoggins is going to be the lowest-owned, one of the lower-owned, priciest people. Um, I'm hoping Holly Holmes like the highest-owned person on the guard, to be honest. Um, yeah, same. Yeah, which I will have zero exposure to. But, um, yeah, I think Scoggins makes an intriguing play in GBPs. Um, I just don't know if he's going to meet that... Um, pay off that price tag. So I don't know if I'm going to play him in cash for that price tag. Uh, but GBPs, yeah, that's fine. I'd like to get him at a lower ownership than most. And, you know, hopefully he chokes out Sasaki in the second round or something like that. But that's where I'm at on it. I'm going to side Scoggins here, but I wouldn't be shocked either way. Um, don't know if I totally agree with Vegas, but that's why they're Las Vegas and I'm not. So you think it should be tighter? A little bit. I, I think so. I think Sasaki's proven that, um, he can handle the wrestlers and the grapplers. Um, he it wasn't finished by Hayes. Um, he's pretty good defensively off his back. Uses his length, like I said, to um, control the top position. And um, yeah, that's where I stand on it. Yeah, Scoggins also does. I mean, he's in, he's super young and you know should be improving, but he he has shown a bad habit of diving into uh, submissions and guillotines um, in the past. So. Saki could be could be live for that reason, but um, yeah, I agree. There, all all signs should point to Scoggins winning. Uh, if he if he were to miss weight, but say the fight were to still go off, how would that make you? How would that affect how you played it? I don't know, man. I I think I'd still the same. I mean, he's been fighting at band weight, so maybe he feels even more comfortable with that extra weight that he couldn't get off. But he could feel miserable from uh, the lack of nutrition he has and the cutting. Um, I'll have to wait and see him on the scale, see how he looks. Uh, I, I'm hoping he makes weight. Obviously, mm -hmm. I think we all are. 
Um, but I think it's a, I think he's in a good spot here. Um, I do like the value in Sasaki. So kind of torn on this one. But Scoggins is my pick to win. Um, not sure if he gets the finish, though. Okay. Anyway, hit me with the next stuff. Alex, next Cas- Alex Bruce Leroy Caceres versus Rolando. Is it D or die? D. Rolando D. Caceres comes in at 9,100. Is a minus 325 favorite. Finish prop at plus 120. D is 7,100. Price or er, the comeback is plus 265, and the finish prop is plus 455. What do you like in this one? GPP cash. Break it down. Um, I like Caceres here. I'm trying to see if this is a short notice fight. Yes. Uh, well, he was. A, I guess he was originally linked to a, a, a fight with a different guy named Wang Guan. Um, now he's fighting Rolando D. Uh, I like Caceres. I mean, I think he should have you know more skills just about everywhere. D is a, a Muay Thai fighter, uh, Filipino, um, and his his ancillary skills, his other skills are improving, uh, but he's still kind of just like a one note Muay Thai fighter. Um, he's got good kicks, but he's pretty unlike uh, Caceres, who's like very movement oriented, very flowy, can cover a lot of distance. Um, throws a lot of flashy stuff from long range. D is just like very traditional Muay Thai, uh, leg kicks, um, head kicks, you know, just like, but he's pretty stationary, pretty upright, um, like kind of close range and he's not very good at pressuring. And so I think he's going to have a hard time, uh, getting to Caceres and, and, um, really being able to land consistently. Caceres can be hit on the counter. Um, he doesn't always have the best head movement when he comes in with his hands, but, um, he's generally shown to have a pretty solid shin and I just think he's got just more, just more tools, just, just so many more tools, both stand like both in the straight up standing. And if he can, um, take the fight to the mat, D is not very strong on the ground. He tends to get, um, stuck in submissions that he has to kind of just like gut his way out of. Um, so he's tough, but you know, that's not a recipe for success long term. Um, and Caceres, you know, doesn't normally shoot like traditional takedowns, but when the fight ends up in the clinch, he has shown that he can like body lock dudes and slam them to the ground. He was kind of ragdolling um, Cole Miller at different times in their fight where he looked outstanding for most of that fight. Um, the, pro- the trouble with Caceres is that he's just kind of inconsistent. He's kind of flowy. He doesn't, you know, necessarily, ha- he's not necessarily a dude who comes in with like a specific focus or like a specific game plan or like, um, have a clear idea of like what he wants to do in that fight to that opponent. He just kind of like goes with the flow and strikes and just kind of like whatever he feels like in the moment, that's what he does. So um, that kind of style doesn't lend itself to um, doesn't lend itself to like blowing dudes out in the first round because he's not, you know, really going after dudes like that, even if he's, you know, better than them. Um, so that's really the only thing that kind of scares me off here. I think that he should win. I'm picking him to win what, by um, a pretty dominant decision, pretty clear-cut decision, or submission in the second half of the fight is my pick. So for his price, um, I'll have exposure to him in, in, in tournaments, some exposure to him. Um, could he finish in, early in the first round? Could he you know, score really, really highly? I think that he could. Um, let me check his fight metric real quick and see how what his significant strikes land per minute are. He doesn't throw, I guess... 3.72 strikes land per minute. It's not a ton of output. He's not generally a dude who who lands a ton of strikes. He did land 97 against Cole Miller, but Cole, Cole Miller is was a very stationary target in that fight, and I could D is a striker out while Miller is a jiu-jitsu practitioner. Um, I see this fight maybe being a little bit kind of like Caceres' fight with Masio Fullen. Fullen is, I guess, a boxer, kickboxer. Um, and Caceres just kind of ran circles around him. And that fight scored or landed 75 strikes, um, which isn't a, it's okay, I guess. Um, all is to say, I'll have some exposure to, to Caceres in tournaments. Not sure that I want to have him in cash because he is you know, not necessarily the most reliable when I pay off the price. Um, so I'll think about it. D, I don't think they'll really have much exposure to. Hard to see him having an avenue to victory in this one. And Drew is somewhere, so I will go ahead and introduce the next fight and kind of see what happens. Um, so Walt Harris and Cyril Asker are next. Um, there you are. 
What's up, man? About to introduce the uh, Ask Your Harris fight. Sorry about that. All good? Yep. You all good? Yeah, I'm good to go. All right. All right, so Harris is 9,200 on DraftKings. Asker is 7,000 on DraftKings. Um, Harris opened at plus 215, but has since moved out to minus, I'm sorry, opened at minus 215 and is now gone out to minus 350. Asker opened at at plus, sorry, plus 165 and has since moved out to plus 290. Harris has the best inside distance prop on the card at minus 180, while Asker's is plus 482. So are you all in on Harris in this fight? Uh, I think I am. And uh, creating alpha is throwing shots here. Throwing shots at me on Twitter. I think they're chirping my shitty apartment that I live in. I'm about to buy a house. Everybody chill out. Your apartment's dope, dude, especially after uh, Lars got in there and uh, decorated it for you. <laughs> oh, the SO. You're, Joe's going to kill me on that one. Anyway, um, yeah, Walt Harris. Uh, most recently, smashed Chase Sherman. Uh, super athletic guy, really strong. Um, light on his feet, very, very mobile. Um, insane power in his hands. Uh, great combinations. Um, Asker, he's one and one in the UFC. He's a BJJ brown belt. He's quicker than you think. Um, pretty agile for a guy that doesn't really look agile. And um, he fought Jared Cannonier in his debut. And he clinched with him, almost had him to the ground, um, but then was brutally knocked out um, in his debut. And then his next fight, he fought Smolyakov and kind of surprised some people when he shot for a takedown, took him to the ground, quickly got full mount and um, put the lights out on him. So that's the only issue I'm going to have with Harris is when he fought Abdurakimov, he was very hesitant at the threat of wrestling and grappling. Uh, I didn't want to be taken down. And Sao Palele. Um, got him to the ground and worked him over too. But I'm not sure Asker's going to have that same exce- success. I don't think he's at the same level as Abdurakimov. So I'm hoping he is not tentative versus um, Asker and, and the threat of his jiu-jitsu. So I'm going to be on Harris here. Uh, I think he finishes this fight in the first round. I think there's just too much um, for Asker on the feet. So I'll make it quick here. I'm on Walt Harris. Um, first round finish. It's tough. I'm a little bit sad to go against uh, Asker who – Paid off pretty well for us the last time around. He was only like, I forget what his odds were. It was close to even money against Smolikov, and we went pretty hard on him. Um, I even played him in cash as like a minus 120 favorite or something like that. And won a bunch of money. But yeah, he's should be totally outgunned here against, against Harris. So I'm with you. Um, so we got Gomi and Tuck next. You want to hit me with the prices on them? He's saying he doesn't know what costs more, a house in Pittsburgh or the Conor McGregor fight. Well, I know which one I would buy, and it's not <laughs> a carnival ass. I, I don't know if he was coming at my crappy apartment, but I don't care. You're Pittsburgh? Whatever. Pittsburgh's nice. I yeah, miss Pittsburgh. I do. I don't ever want to leave. Uh, we're glad you're gone for the record. <laughs> Thanks, bro. Yep. All right. John Tuck comes in at 8,800, is a minus 300 favorite. Uh, Finish prop minus th- 131. Takanori Gomi, the walking zombie, is 7,400 pre- <laughs> plus 250, and the finish prop is plus 381. Um, is this it for Gomi, or has he got some more life in the tank? No, he hasn't had life in the tank uh, <laughs> in like five or six years. It's, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm surprised. He's fought good fighters of late. I mean, getting... Getting beaten, I should say, by Joe Lozon, Jim Miller, and Miles Jury isn't in itself, you know, an embarrassing thing. Um, but the way that he's gotten just annihilated, he hasn't seen the third minute. Um, or should say he hasn't, gone, he hasn't gone past three minutes in any of those fights. He just gets taken down, mounted, and pounded out mercilessly, and it's, uh, it's pretty ugly. Um, even... Prior to that, he fought Isaac Valley Flag in a really ugly fight that he ended up winning by, I think, somewhat controversial decision. Um, So he just, I mean, and even in that fight, he, Isaac Valley Flag isn't, was never like a world, a world beater by any, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, And Gomi's cardio looks terrible. Um, He gets really sloppy on the feet sometimes. He throws bombs and, you know, like they'll play on his highlight reel, I'm sure, his knockout of Tyson Griffin. When he connects with one of those bombs, you know, good things can happen. But any fighter with any, um, you know, fight IQ or, 
you know, tools to avoid, you know, a wild haymaker should, should beat him. Now, Tuck, the problem is that Tuck himself is not very reliable. He's a dude who um, takes his foot off the gas routinely. He's got skills. Like, I think he's a Taekwondo um, fighter with a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Um, he's looked good at times. Like, he broke Damian Brown's nose in the first round of his last fight, but then, like, totally let Brown back into the fight by just, like, being super gun-shy the rest of the time. Um, who did he fight before that? I think he knocked someone else down in his previous fight, and kind of the same thing happened. Oh, um, he fought Josh Emmett on short notice, and Emmett has turned out to be a pretty solid prospect, I think. Um, but Emmett had, like, the broken finger, and Tuck didn't really go after him until, like, the very end when it was too late. So, um, but in any case... He should be more than enough to take out the corpse of Takanori Gomi. Um, there's no reason for that Gomi should be able to fight at this level anymore. Um, so the only thing that's making me not go like all in 100% exposure on Tuck, um, given that he's not priced super highly, he's only 8,800, is just the fact of how unreliable he is. How, um, yeah, just I don't know if it's fight IQ or or what the problem is with him, but. Um, Still, he should be. He should get it done. In the first, I'm picking in my first round submission. I think if he has seen any of Gomi's recent fights, the the book on him is clear. You just take him down, advance, pound him after the win. Um, Gomi, like at this point, is basically like Vitor Belfort, but maybe even worse. Probably worse at this point. So that's my take. Um, I think Tuck should be safe for cash or GBPs for sure. I think he has the second best finish prop. Third best finish prop after after the heavyweights, Harrison Tibera, um, and he's not priced above nine k. So that is something to like. He should be pretty highly owned, but um, I think he'll be worth it here. Any any other takes? Target against Gomi, I'm cool with it. Yeah, that's I think pretty much pretty cut and dry. That's, yeah, that's pretty much the analysis. All right, so um, main card time. Um, Rafael Dos Anjos makes his welterweight debut against Tarek Safadine. Um, RDA opened at minus 195 and has since gone out to minus 270. Safadine opened at plus 155 and has since gone out to plus 230. Um, RDA is 9,000 on DraftKings and Safadine is 7,200. Uh, Dos Anjos' finished prop is plus 291 and Safadine's is plus 685. So, um, how do you see RDA doing at welterweight, and does he pay off that price? I don't think he pays off that price. Um, so, I don't know how much exposure I'm going to have to RDA. Um, the thing about Safadin is he's fighting up in TriStar, or he's training in TriStar right now. Um, he's a technical fighter, and we were talking kind of off. He described it perfectly. He's a safe fighter. Uh, he doesn't really put himself in risky situations. Uh, he's very disciplined. Um, and looking at the Vegas odds, the finished props, 291, 685. Um, I don't think I really want much of RDA. Uh, maybe a Safadine play in cash because he's cheap and they should get the three rounds. Um, what RDA are we going to get? Uh, how do you see it? What do you think? Yeah, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how RDA looks at Walter Waite. Um, that's really the only thing I'm kind of curious for. Safadine is... Um, there's another guy like this. I can't remember who it was. Someone who just kind of like sucks all the life out of, I think it was like Bojan Velikovic who ended up getting that weird knockout in his last fight. Um, I described him as a guy who kind of like sucks all the fantasy goodness out of a fight. Um, <laughs> Safadine doesn't finish guys, um, but he is rugged and tough enough to not get finished himself. Um, he's got, Pretty good takedown defense. I mean, he he fought Dong Young Kim, like the good Dong Young Kim, to a, pretty much a stalemate in um, his last fight, in a fight that was in the clinch a lot, and he kind of avoided getting taken down and manhandled by Kim, which is usually what he does. Um, he's a technical kickboxer, but he's just he doesn't have a lot of upside, and I, he limits the upside of his opponents is sort of how I see it. So, um, yeah, it's not one that until we kind of see what, what RDA is going to look like, um, you know, maybe without the weight cut, he's rejuvenated and comes out and just is super aggressive and bombs on Safadine. I think RDA will have 
like we'll have the power advantage despite moving up. Um, so, but it's not, yeah, it's not a fight that I really want to target much of other than like you said, maybe Safdie and cash because, um, he could get three rounds of moderate striking, but I don't even know if that's the play. This might be a fade fight for me. Yeah. I mean, we'll get to Betch in a second. Um, your girl. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, anyway, that's good. Let's move on. All right. Stun gun, Dung Hyun Kim versus Colby Covington. Kim comes in at 7,700. Price to, sorry, plus 195 is the underdog. Colby Covington is 8,500, minus 235 favorite. Kim's finish prop is plus 679. Covington is plus 214. I'm hearing some chatter about there. Uh, both ways. Some people like Kim. A lot of people love Covington. He's on the up and up. Where do you side on this? And how much exposure are you going to have to these guys? Um, cash play, GPPs on Covington. Where are we at? Um, I think it's a, I think it's a GBP fight for Colby for me, for the most part, uh, not one that I want, it's not really a fight that I want a ton of exposure to in general, because, um, I think these guys are sort of going in opposite directions in their careers at this point, And that, that should be clear. Um, Kim has still, you know, by and large looked good, but like I just mentioned with Safadine, um, you know, he wasn't dominating. Uh, a clinch and wrestling battle against a guy who's, you know, mostly a kickboxer. And Covington has got that, like, D1 um, wrestling pedigree. He just wrestles the crap out of people. But I think Kim's judo base and just general, like, takedown defense, takedown abilities, clinch abilities, is going to largely negate a lot of what Covington usually likes to do. Like, Covington got 12 takedowns against Brian Barbera in his last fight. Barbarina is solid, and Covington showed that he's, like, you know, ascending to that, like, top 15 level. Um, but trying to wall and maul or, you know, consistently take down and control Dong and Kim for three rounds, like, maybe he gets a bunch of takedowns, but I don't see him really being able to control Kim on the ground. Um, so, Covington, 8500 not super expensive, could pay off the price tag, even in a decision, if he can score a bunch of takedowns. Um, cash for him, maybe, like I said, it's not super expensive. Um, but I also don't really see a ton of upside for him. Like unless Kim has really just fallen off a cliff of late. Um, I just don't see a ton of upside in this fight in general. So it's not one that I'm going to have a ton of exposure to. That's sort of my, my take on it. Um, I don't really see a lot of upside for Kim. Um, you know, his, I think the most that he can really hope for here is to kind of like stalemate it and end up on the right side of a split decision is like his, his ceiling, which, you know, isn't really enough to target. So, um, yeah, you have anything else you want to add? No, I think I kind of agree with you there. Um, I mean, if Covington storms, I think you're sitting pretty, but I think he will be highly owned based on his, um, his record and whatnot. And, Barbarino was his biggest step up in talent, but I just think Kim's faced much higher talent and uh, has the skill set to kind of hold him off and negate him, but we'll see how it goes. Yeah. All right, so Kuhn main event time. we got heavyweights. Um, Marcin Tybura is taking on Andre Arlovsky. Tybura is the favorite. He opened at minus 190, but is now out to minus 250. Arlovsky opened at plus 150 and is now out to plus 210. Tiber's finished prop is the second best on the card at minus 136, while Orlovsky's is plus 411. Tiber is 8,700 on DraftKings, and Orlovsky is 7,500 on DraftKings. So what are you thinking here? Um, is Tiber safe enough in cash? Um, you're willing to go all in on him. Is Orlovsky toast at this point? What do you think? Yeah, I think Orlovsky's burnt toast at this point. Um, four straight finishes. Um, even before that, it was a questionable decision win over Frank Mir. His chin is completely blown up. Um, he leaves himself open all the time. And I just think this is the end for him. Uh, I think this is a really good spot for Tybora. Kind of experience that, that big fight feel, the pressure of a big fight. Um, he has two finishes to his name. Luis Henrique and Victor Pesta with a sweet head kick. Um, likes to throw that leg left kick a lot. Uh, he's a seasoned striker. He's good on the ground as well. Um, he took down Luis, Luis Henrique. Um, and use that jujitsu background of his, uh, and he's very solid on the ground. So I think Arlossi's kind of at the gatekeeper role at this point. 
maybe trying to milk out his contract. I don't know what his contract's at, but it can't be anything. He can't be signed long term. I think this is it for him. He's probably, he's probably making decent money. Heavyweights. Yeah. I mean, he's the co-main on a crap card, and he's got the name value. Yeah. So he's probably making some money. Um, now, Tybora, has he fought this level of talent? I don't know if Arlovsky of now is the same. You know, you can't really say that about his level of talent. So I'm going to be on Tybora here. I know, hot take. But at his price tag, 8,700, minus 250, minus 136 to finish. I think he is definitely a GPP play. Um, I would say you could play him in cash. I, I, like, I overthink this all the time. Like, I hate playing heavyweights in cash. You know that. Um, but I don't know if it gets much safer than him. Maybe Walt Harris too. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. We, um, try to talk beforehand. I mean, like it's pretty rare that you want to play a heavyweight fight in cash, but both these dudes look pretty safe. Um, Arlovsky is crafty. Um, I think Sun Tzu, I saw on Twitter said that, um, Arlovsky isn't, didn't train with Jackson. Is yeah, 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 yeah. He did. He did say that by Jackson. So that's, that's interesting. That doesn't bode well for, for Arlovsky, um, you know, Arlovsky did have a four-fight losing streak similar a few years ago. This is heavyweight, so, you know, never count anybody out. Um, but the fact that he left Jackson or isn't training at Jackson's for this fight uh, doesn't bode well. Obviously, Tybura is like a prospect on the, on the come-up. Um, I could see the fight going to, like, decision, though, because, like, Tybura didn't get Pesta or Henrique out of there until um, the second and third rounds of their fight. So, um, and Pesta is just bad, has no head movement or like defense of any kind. And, um, anyway, that's the only thing that's making me kind of like not want to go all in on, on Tybura. I mean, I love his price, love his upside. Definitely think he can win, but I'm just worried that he doesn't pay off because it takes him until the third round to get all to like land, land the shot. Um, so I don't know. You have any response to that or? No, I mean, I think Arlovsky's chain is shot, and I don't know if it'll take much to put him down. Um, yeah. So, like I said, Tybora, I feel pretty confident about him. And at that price tag, it's so juicy. Yeah. And there's a lot of others that I'm kind of up in the air about. So, I think for 8,700 and that safety, you'll probably see him in quite a few of my lineups. Yeah. Even though, I mean, he's probably going to be one of the highest guys on the card, you have to think. Um, yeah. And, I mean, there's – some merit to pivoting to him and GPPs, but I mean, sometimes it's not bad to pay up for the chalk. Like sometimes it's the right move. So yeah, yeah, fair enough. All right, let's jump into Josh's favorite fight of the night. The main event, Holy home versus best Kohea. Holy home is $9,600 is the minus 600 favorite with a plus one, th- one thirty three finish prop. And Kohea is $6,600. The comeback is plus four fifty, and a finish prop of 1,070. <laughs> All in on Kohea. Yeah, uh, I like Kohea. <laughs> I kind of, I mean, as as far as a play goes, I far and away prefer Kohea. I, I'm going to completely fade home, hundred um, percent. Could she land like a head kick and get a finish? Uh, yeah, but I don't think it's super likely. And um, what's her finish prop? You said one thousand seventy. That's that's betch. Oh, sorry, 133. Almost, yeah, almost 133. I mean, I think that's even generous. Um, it, I kind of feel bad for Holm, like the way that she's kind of tumbled since being Rousey. Like, it was such like a seminal moment. Um, catapulted her, catapulted her superstar, and now she's under this like giant microscope, and it looks like that she like can't perform. I think it was just like a stylistic, like this, just a perfect stylistic matchup for her. Um, Rousey's complete utter lack of striking defense and um, inability to make adjustments and des- like single-minded desire to charge into the clinch. Um, no one else is going to do that with her. Most other people kind of like stay away from her a little bit because they're worried about getting too close to the, the vaunted striker Holly Holm, but she um, pulls her punches generally doesn't like, doesn't put her weight behind a lot of her punches. She throws and she yells and she moves around a lot, but she's not landing much of note for the most part. And um, she's there to be countered, especially when she's throwing hands. She doesn't move her head a ton. Um, and, you know, obviously, I, I don't think Betch Cohea is a world beater, but a lot of people, um, I don't know if it's the 
I'm not sure if I'm in my own little bubble here. I don't think that she's, I think she's definitely improved since the uh, Rousey fight. She beat a bunch of women who like weren't that great. Um, Shayna Baszler and uh, who was her, Jessamyn Duke, just like Baszler was the tail end of her career. Duke was never that good. She beat them up, talked away into this title fight with Rousey, said all this like horrible stuff and then got like her comeuppance and got decked and knocked out in an embarrassing fashion and everyone's like, oh, okay, you suck. And I was among those people. But she's looked better of late. Like, you might think her antics are ridiculous. Her, her dancing and her trash talking and her uh, just demeanor might be off-putting to you, which is fine. Um, but she's not that bad, I don't think, either. Like, she's a decent counter-striker. She's not super athletic or um, much of a takedown threat. Um, but she's a decent boxer. And um, she gets to, like on her nickname is the pit bull and she is aggressive at weigh-ins and stuff. And so like commentators will talk about how like, Oh, she's so aggressive and she uh, is the pit bull and she comes forward and wants to brawl and blah, blah, blah. Like she hasn't really wanted to do that in her last few fights. Like she had pretty measured fights um, with Rocky Pennington, who's now a top five bantamweight. Um, that was a really close fight. She was beating, um, Ah, she was her name. Muay Thai fighter. Brown belt in jiu-jitsu. Ended up going to a draw with her. Mary Reno, sorry. Was pretty soundly beating Mary Reno in the striking for two rounds before she got uh, clipped and almost finished in the third round and had to settle for a draw. Um, all this to say, I just don't see, like, home having a giant giant edge here like technically speaking in terms of like weapons and pedigree uh yeah obviously she's got the advantage but in terms of actually like um in terms of actually fighting in the cage i just don't think there's that much of a difference between them like i don't see there being, being that wide of a gap so anyway all this to say i don't think home pays off her price unless she can like land a head kick in the first round and even then would she even pay off 9,600? She's not going to get takedowns or grappling points. Um, Kohea, if she lands, let's looking at fight metric and Holmes' last few opponents. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not trying to say that Besh Kohea is Jermaine Durand to me or Valentin Shevchenko uh, by any means either, but um, like when Holm fought Pennington, Pennington landed 40 strikes. Um, in three rounds. So I could see Kohea doing something like that. She lands, you know, <clears throat> 50, 60 strikes, gets you 25, 30 points. And in cash, I don't think that's terrible necessarily so that you can, you punt with her and then you pay up for five, other, five favorites and three of them being like really big favorites. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I don't think that's the, the worst strategy. Um, I just think that she's got a pretty solid floor. Um, and if she even eked the win out, I wouldn't honestly be that surprised. Um, so that's sort of my take. Do you have anything you want to add to that? No, nah, man, you hit it on the head with that one. Uh, I'm definitely not going to be paying that price tag. Um, tossed around Betch in cash, but I don't know. I got a couple days here to uh, take in the other content, which is a good segue. Thank you to Brett and Chris for hosting us on the um, channel, as always. Make sure you turn in, tune in to uh those guys on thursday on roto grinders grinders live uh unfortunately creating alpha decided not to have a show this week so uh they don't get a plug but normally listen to them on every friday um and all the other great content that they put out josh has a blog follow him on roto grinders jds86 um, um we're on the fence about next week i'm gonna be on vacation josh is moving so um yeah, we'll keep you guys posted on that one. We'll try to get one out if we can. Um, other than that, Josh, that's all I have. Do you have anything for the good of the cause? Um, yeah, real quick. Uh, if you like the content, help us out. Give us a like on um, the video here. Love that. That's super good. Um, in terms of, I got some stuff coming out. Um, now that school's winding down. I've got more time to write, so that's always, that's always good. Um, I'm going to try to come out with, for something for low kick about uh, the worst bookings of 2017 so far, given uh, that this main event is trash. So be on the lookout for that. Follow me on Twitter uh, so you can see that. 
uh, when, I, when I post that stuff. I'm also having something uh, really cool coming out for champions. Um, uh, they're doing like, um, if, I don't know if you've, if you follow champions, I think it's at champions fight on Twitter. Um, they are doing like, they've been doing like these fanzine type things for like really big events. And they're doing a fanzine for, um, Bellator 180 where they have like really awesome art and some like cool articles on there. And I'm contributing to that talking about the, uh, Stone and Vanderlei fight and kind of like what it means for Bellator and kind of what we should expect and like, where do they go from there? Just sort of breaking down all the threads of that, um, of that fight. So check that out. I would uh, really appreciate that. Uh, that I'm not sure when exactly that should be coming out, probably fight week of belt for 180. So next week, I guess that will be sometime. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Um, hopefully I'll be turning out lots of stuff now that it's summertime and I can just kind of focus on MMA and writing and stuff like that. So hopefully, um, I get that, that going a little bit more. So thank you guys for watching, uh, for drew. I'm Josh. Good luck this week, drew. Thank you. I appreciate keep train, it. Keep this train rolling. We got a bench clearing situation in the Pirates game here. Uh-oh. Tensions are high. All right. Anyway. <laughs> All right. I'll see you guys hopefully next week, if not um, week after, whenever the next card is. Peace.